just like take a cog out, flip it, put it back in, and look at the CPU. Again. Where does the IP start? That's, that's I don't think we need IP. <laughs> that's a world IP. We are live. Yep, we are. <clears throat> Matt couldn't make it. Yeah, they drive on Dabble. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, Matt. You're watching this live. I don't know if he's watching it live or not. But he said he was going to watch it. Oh, he that. All right. <laughs> so, hi. Uh, Listen to the news. Occasionally, is it in the morning? I have a smart home device that listens in on you. Go through the news. And then I heard about this, which was predictive restaurant orders. They're going through based on like the car, the type of car. They kind of change their preparations based on that. And I thought it was. It was interesting because it kind of made me think about what we were doing in, in this in this class and that you've got you had to have somebody record all the cars that were coming through. Make and model, in some cases color. Alright? And then look at their orders. What did they order? So your independent variable is just basic cars because and you can't really rely on seeing the drivers because you don't know who's coming through. All that you can see is the car. I right, guarantee to see, see the make and model. Then they look at the orders. <clears throat> so all your car information qualities, those are all your independent variables. Right? Color, make, model, maybe condition. Uh, and then your dependent variable was order. And what they're coming up with is this. Basically, based on what you're driving, they can start preparing food with a pretty decent degree of reliability. So the one, maybe it actually wasn't on smart home device, device, maybe it was the news after I dropped off my daughter, but they were talking about like fast food place. If you see a minivan coming through, minivans are more likely driven by females, more likely with kids, which results in a higher frequency of kid meals being sold. So if you see a minivan coming in line to a car, you ramp up some of your production of the, the meat. If you see a big pickup truck coming through, again, higher probability that it is a, uh, what, I'll, what I'll say is a burly male. They said, <laughs> yes, lots of burgers, lots of cheese, lots of fries, yes. all right, supersize everything. All right, okay. and they said some other stuff, but you kind of think about how did it happen? Well, it's through model simplification, through statistical simplification, which is what we're doing. All right, this is where we're going. So, real life example of this. You know, someday, maybe Blake will be the next Rito analyst. Right? Every single one. So wow. yeah, it's <laughs> pretty cool. I'm pretty cool. You think that maybe they go up for like your own question or something? Well, if they can track you, yeah, they they might. So guys, we can become outliers by just ordering with a random number generator. Dude, I'm just saying. I I drive a Toyota Camry, and I very often buy a lot more food than just one person would normally buy. So I'd be I'd be breaking. I used to drive a minivan too. That would be great. In the in the news story, that they mentioned some some vehicle, and they said. If they're driving this, expect to sell items off of the dollar menu. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what they said. But a little off topic. That's me. I should say a lot off topic. Man, I watched this yesterday. I caught that, you know, the glitter bomb guy put out a new video. <clears throat> All right. And this one actually goes after the phone scammers. These scammers that kind of send you an email saying, hey, you owe this money or something like that. So then you call them back and, and uh, man, a huge operation, 23 minutes, check it out. This is Mark Grover's the guy that, that has been doing all those litter bombs. I'm sure you guys have seen it, right? Mark, what? No? Yeah. Oh. Well, he targeted the Portuguese, right? What's that? The package thieves, yeah, he is ex-NASA engineer. Yeah, 
did it so GPS tracking would throw glitter all over the place and, and you don't have kids. You, you don't have the luxury of, of understanding <laughs> kids everywhere. So yeah, he, him, like the newest version includes like fart spray and sirens and oh, you just have no laugh. But interesting uh, to say the least. He had, that actually talks about so this is where they kind of get you to log into your computer and they adjust, they actually take over your bank and manipulate what's being shown so it looks like, when you go to the web page, it looks like you've received incorrect amounts and then, there, then they kind of convince you to pay it back because you want to do the right thing. It's very, I mean, it really is kind of believable, maybe. I don't know, I wouldn't ever do this. But more money I love my bank account behind it. Right? <laughs> and, it, and it turns out that it is like you've got call centers like this in in this case it was India where they just they feel a hundred calls a second or something like that. And they, they run through out of all of these you have like five hundred people. So let's say they run through like a million phone calls, maybe like five hundred people actually call, and out of those five hundred people you get ten to twelve of them that give like ten to you know, uh, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. What they're sending through the mail, and they kind of coach you through it. And the guy just like glitter bomb that whole office. No. So what? <laughs> if, if, you, if you watch it, like the long story is that it doesn't actually go there. They contract with somebody else who ends up being a supervisor, who manages mules that go pick up the boxes, open up the boxes, and then send them off. And you know, they keep a portion of the cash, and that's they're, they're targeting these, these mules. Uh, and the, the addresses, I mean, it's very specific where it's like, you have to ship it overnight, they give you the address, because then you, you have the tracking number, and the person like doesn't live there, you know, they're using you know, uh, Airbnb, you know, short-term rentals, person basically meets the FedEx driver out at the door, gets the package and leaves. So it's, it's hard to track. It's, yeah, it definitely is. I, I was, I was, I was caught. I, I, it, it caught me in as I, as I watched it. The other regular glitter bombs, I just laughed, laughed my butt off. <laughs> this paper. Oh no, I stopped it. So, all right, this is where we left off. Did our clack size, right? Did that problem, got through it. And this is a situation with like these cars. So not just like a minivan, but what color of minivan is that, that predicted? Because you might have most minivans, you know, most, let's say, soccer moms driving, you know, your sporty type minivans, and you've got the four college and graduate students driving, you know, the beat up. Silver, <laughs> silver minivan, <laughs> rusted out bottoms, and so forth. Uh, anyways, we've kind of worked through pretty the pretty easy one, where it's a main effect is significant. What happens if we have a significant interaction? All right, and this this is this is where where we're going. So we've talked about you know what does it mean for that interaction? We showed you on the figures where. The interaction term is actually quantifying the slope of those lines. If the interaction term is not significant, then our slopes are the same. The effect of the variable is independent of our level of that second variable, and vice versa. All right, so we could then say the effect of variable one is you know increasing or decreasing. Let's say positive correlation or negative correlation, and that have, that's regardless of that second variable. And the second variable, again, is maybe a positive correlation or a negative correlation, regardless of the other one. But if you have a significant interaction, then that positive or negative variable, that positive or negative correlation depends on what we're looking at. So for the color red, a red minivan, maybe it's a positive correlation for you know, increasing in, in you know, kids' minis. But if it's a blue car, maybe it's a negative correlation. So you've got that correlation changes depending on what level. All right, so how do we actually go about interpreting that? So our approach, when we have a significant interaction, is to start taking subsets. 
we're going to have to take one variable first, make subsets across it, and then look at what is the effect of that other variable within that subset. And then we're going to have to do it the other, the other way too. We're going to have to take subsets of that second variable and look at the reverse. All right, so example. Let's say we have letters and colors on height. This is just a generic example. All right, so we've got letters, which is one variable, letters A, B, and C, and we have colors that say red and blue. And we're looking at, I don't know, height, you know, height of something. We have a significant interaction. So how do we go about analyzing? Well, first, we can't do a two keys yet because we've got this interaction term. So what we're going to do is take a subset. So first, we're going to take all of the red colors and do a regular A nova on that. So we see, is height affected by the letters? Yes or no? And we're going to do the same thing with the blue. All of the blue. Is height affected by the letters? This is, now, this is an ANOVA. We've got three levels. So if we get a significant effect, if we see that, yes, letters does have an effect on height for all of the red, then we do a regular Tukey's Poisson test. All right. If it's not significant, we stop. We know there's no association between letters and height for the red, for all of the individuals that are red. We look at the blue. If there's a significant interaction, do our Tukey's Poisson test to, to explain that. If it's not significant, then, then you know, uh, we stop there. So that's for all of the red and the blue. But then we also have to take subsets of our letters. So look at the A's and the B's and the C's and run our A nova to see, does color have an effect on height for the letter A? Does color have an effect of height for the letter B and so forth? Now in this case, if we get a significant test, we just, we, we don't have to, Stop, or we don't have to do a post-stop test because it's only two levels. But a lot of times, all your variables will have three or more letters. So you're stuck at doing the first is the ANOVA and then follow it up with a post-stop test. All right, so here's our, our example, our work through for the plant growth. There, here's our work through. It's plant growth.csv, right? So lowercase, it's posted on Blackboard. Right? The idea here is that we grew beans in two different treatments, all right? We had different nutrient conditions. So we're watering the plants every day, and the water that we're adding is either low nutrient, medium nutrient, or high nutrient conditions, all right? And then these plants also, each combination of plants is grown in different amount of light conditions. So we went out to the greenhouse, and we've got some plants that are full sunlight, 100% light, We've got some uh, with a 25% shade cloth on it, so 75% light. We have some with a 50% shade cloth and some with a 75% shade cloth. So we've got this factorial combination, low, medium, high nutrients. We got 25% light, 50% light, 75% light, and 100% light. Okay. All different combinations. And what we measured was height and biomass on bean plants after three weeks, because we want to see what effect does nutrient and light have on both the height of the plant and the biomass of that plant? All right. So our overall question with this is, does the amount of light and nutrients affect the plant height in the bean? Now, before we kind of go on, just I want to have a note about treatments. All right. So both our light and the nutrient levels are assumed to be measured without any sort of error. All right. This is saying we're basically creating these conditions ourselves. All right, and and you could say, well, yeah, there there should be error, especially since we're mixing up nutrients, right? But we're going to assume they're not. We're going to assume that it's fixed. We're going to assume that there is no error. That when we make up more low nutrient conditions, that it is exactly the same as all the other low nutrient conditions. Because of this situation. We refer to these factors as fixed effects, uh, fixed effects variables. There's no error associated with that measurement. We use shade cloth that was rated. So we assume that whatever that shade cloth is rated, all of the plants that, that were under that shade cloth, cloth removed the exact same amount of light. Now, if we actually measured the light levels, 
Now we have some measurement there. If we actually measure that nutrient solution, now we have some measurements without air, or measurements with air, and we can go ahead and kind of do the analysis. Does it necessarily matter here for this, this problem? No, it doesn't. But in your, right, in your project, your thesis project, you may have some situations where you have to account for uh, variation in how you, re you recorded your data. So these are fixed effects because they're assumed to be measured without error. Also, in the data set, we recorded the percentage light levels as a numeric variable. If we read it into R, R is going to read that as a number. So if we try to do any sort of, of uh, analysis with it, it's going to try to fit more of a continuous variation to it. Like think, of it think of it as X and Y instead of categories. So what we're going to have to do when we get it into R, we're going to have to factor that light variable so that it actually reads appropriately to 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100%. How do we do this? I've mentioned it before. This here is you know, a refresher on how to refactor variables. Right. We're going to use the, the factor function. So we're going to factor a vector, right, and we're going to specify the levels. We can specify the labels, too, if we wanted to. All right. But what we're going to do is we're going to factor a vector, and we're going to assign the levels that are going to appear. And those levels are basically our group. All right. uh, we don't have to worry about labels, but just in case you were wondering, if let's say we had, uh, we numbered our treatments one, two, three, and four. Right. In our data set, in our, in our actual Excel file, you could have keyed it as 1, 2, 3, and 4. But maybe those 1, 2, 3, and 4 referred to different drugs that were like really long and complicated. You didn't want to type it in all the time. So what you would do is use the labels function to say, okay, if it's a 1, this is the actual drug name. If this is a 2, this is the actual drug name. R still analyzes it as a factor, but anytime you graph it, or plot it, or to make a table of it, it reports the labels instead of one, two, three, and four. Uh, Blake's data, all right? You key in zero as uninfected, one as infected. He can refactor it and put labels to say uninfected is zero, infected is one. So when he does a plot of it, it'll say uninfected and infected instead of zero and one. Simple way to do it. All right. so. Read in your data, what we want to do is change light to a factor and change nutrients from low to high. So we want to reorder it using this factor. Now again, the levels, how you specify, the order that you specify the levels in, that's how R will plot it. And when you're done, you can use the aggregate function just to see if it, if it worked correctly, or even the plot do plot height as a function of nutrients, plot height as a function of light or something like that, just to make sure that it appears in the correct order and you get the correct type of box and whiskers plot. As you do that, I'm, I'm going to read it in and get it into our mark.
just to kind of demonstrate why. How your plot would look like if you did not factor the light. It plots it as a scatter plot, which is the appropriate type of plot when you have two continuous variables. For nutrients, when we plot it, you can see that it's out of order. It goes high, low, and medium. Why is that? It's because if it doesn't have an order, it plots it alphabetically. So we want to specify those, those orders specified as a factor. for you? I'm still working on. So remember, we don't need the labels if we're not trying to change how it displays. The only, only time you use labels is if you use like some sort of coding, say num numeric coding, and you want the display whenever you plot it to actually show what that number refers to. So like 0, 1, uninfected versus infected. Or if you did white crappie and black crappie and you shorthanded it into WC and BC. But you don't want it to appear like that. You want it to appear as white crappie and black crappie. You can use the labels. Okay.
are not words. Oh. Not too many for names. This is like stop creating more bubbles. And if you do bubbles, you can do more ideas. Yeah. Yeah. 20, 25, 50, 25. <laughs> BPM is like they're not I hear some relevant questions going on. So let's talk about it. So I read it in. And how do we know it actually changed? Check this. I dropped it. Nutrient is the factors with three levels, and it's reported as high, low, and medium, right? Because it's gonna it's gonna report it alphabetically. That's that's the default. Light is reported not as a factor with four levels, but as an integer with all these numbers. So an integer is a numeric data type. All right. So how do we go about doing that? Well, I started with light. All right. Oops, levels. Yep. Plant growth white doesn't work because it's not a factor. So how do we kind of how do we solve that? How do we solve that? Because we need to give the levels exactly as they appear in the data set. What can we do? How about table? Table tells me exactly how many. I had 75 of each of these. So I've got, I've got a number of 25, I've got 50, I've got 75, and 100, all right? So that's what I need. Those are the numbers that I need. So now I'm going to refactor it. So I'm factoring plant growth dollar sign light. That's our vector. I'm going to factor it, and I'm going to read it back into that same vector. And I'm specifying the levels. The levels that we have is 25, 50, 75, and 100. And I did put them in, in quotation marks. I don't know if it matters. Didn't want to try, but that's just been a standard. All right, so now, watch this. When I, so we're dealing with light, which is right here. If I run it, look how it changed. Now it reports it as factor with three levels. I'm sorry, factor with four levels, and it reports it as 25, 50, 75, and then dot, 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 which we know is 100. So now, that changed. If I look at the plot, now I get a box plot, which is an appropriate type of figure if you have a continuous dependent variable, categorical independent variable. All right? Nutrients. I have high, low, high, and who knows what else. Well, I'd use my levels. I'd figure out it's medium. I need to get this order into low, medium, and high. I need it to appear exactly in that order with the exact, written exactly. So again, it's plant growth nutrients. That's our vector. We're going to read it back into the same vector, all right? basically overriding it. Right? We're specifying the levels so that it appears as low, medium, and high. Well, if you wouldn't have overridden it, no, if you, you uh, save it as a new, yes, so you have to resave it. If you didn't, then it's just a one-time deal, it does it, R forgets it. Yep, so I, I run it, and now you can see it's three levels, low, medium, and I guess if we expand it, no, we get low, medium, and dot, dot, dot. So now if I do my plot, I get in the low, medium, high order, which is what we want. Right? Lord? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get um, light into the box plot? Yeah, because light is just giving you XY, XY, that's an XY graph. So a box plot, R looks at the data type. R looks at the data type and says, okay, we've got two variables. We have an X and we have a Y. What is the type of the X variable? If it sees a number, it's going to make an XY scatter plot. If it sees a factor, it's going to make a box plot. So if it made that plot with a bunch of dots on it, 
didn't create that, that factor. Do your drop down, you should see light is a factor with four levels. Is it? Yeah, I got that. Okay, then you did plot, height is a function of light, data plant growth. Uh -huh. Did you rerun it? Yeah, I'll run it again. So I, we're factoring this plant growth dollar sign light. So I read it in as plant growth. So I'm factoring that vector, and I'm saving it back into that vector. I will do give you a, a word of caution. If you accidentally add something X else, so you think you had none here, right? We'll plot that none. It knows we have a fourth level none, but we don't have any items in our data set. This can be problematic if you try to run like a regression analysis or a t-test because it'll say, it'll complain that it doesn't have any data for that. So always, whenever you do this, make a plot, use the aggregate function, make sure that you actually have some data at each level and you didn't make a mistake like this, where you, where you thought you had another very another group, uh, but you didn't. So what's the difference between labels and levels? Labels, see if we can we, we do this. Labels will change how things appear. So, let's do this. I'm going to read this back in. Um, like labels on the plot? Yes, so here, we're going to use our light, all right? So that's our, our light. We got low, we have it as 25, 50, 75, and 100, right? I can use this. Labels, uh, uh, shade, park shade, uh, part sun, and full sun. All right. Now what I've done, what I've done is I've specified the levels. We have 25, 50, 75, and 100. That is how it appears in our variable, in our data set. But I'm going to attach these names to each of these, each of these numbers. So when I factor that and I plot it, it replaces the 25, 50, 75, and 100 with these names. Could be useful. Some of you are doing trees, phylogenetic trees, right? And you've got abbreviations for everything. Yeah, R can allow you to substitute those instead of making the tree and then making little text boxes and getting them all aligned. You know, R can make your tree for you. And, and doing this labels and levels Makes life easier. See, that's in that's in your molecular class, right? The what? You know, no, the trees, trees. Trees are systematic. Of course, we don't do fun molecules. <laughs> make it. We can, we can use R. Branch into it. I wish. Are there a different number of labels <laughs> than 
Yeah. Do you know that? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. We'll try. So let's add one extra level yeah. or one extra label. Right. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> We've got one extra one. Yeah, length five should be one or four. Uh, the one just means if it's nothing, it takes whatever the levels are as the labels. That's our default. All right, so let me read it. Read this in again. Run all of this. May it work. All right, so now that we have it in, we have our data set. Now we're ready to start addressing this question. So does the amount of light and nutrients affect plant height in our beans? So in terms of the null and alternate hypothesis, what are they? What's our null hypothesis to answer this question? Yep, the means are equal. Always. Always, the means are equal. What, are, what means? We're talking about the low nutrient 25% light mean is equal to the medium nutrient 25% light mean, which is equal to the high nutrient 25% light mean, which is equal to the medium nutrient 25% light mean, and so forth. All of our subgroups, all possible combinations are equal. All right? So we have two categorical independent variables, one continuous dependent variables. We're going to use an ANOVA, or we want to use an ANOVA to answer this question. So we need to check our assumptions. Go ahead and check them.
Assumptions met. Yes. Yes. Do QQ plots? Again, you can use QQ plot and write the equation and get all those tiny graphs, or you probably need to start working with subsets. So there's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. This one. Couple points out, but again, they're just right at the extreme. I'm not worried about it. Everything's looking good. Yep, everything's good. I say that we are normally distributed. So then I did Brown Forsyth, we get a p value of 0.5634. Equal variances for homocidacity. It's good. All right. So just checked them. Now we perform our ANOVA. All right, so remember, we create our linear model first, look at the ANOVA table, and you should get something like this. When we get this, do we just report that the interaction term is significant? Yes, we do. We don't. Uh, we don't report anything else because the effect of nutrients depends on what level of light we're looking at. The effect of light depends on what level of nutrients we're looking at. All right? 
We don't know that relationship yet because the effect of nutrient depends on the level of light and vice versa. All right, so at this spot, once we see this interaction term, our lives just became a lot harder. So what do we do? Well, now what we're going to have to do is start to investigate that effect. You might be tempted to say, hey, we stopped there. The interaction is significant. But you're going to have reviewers, you're going to have audience members say, OK, that's significant, but what's the relationship? All right, so what we're going to have to do is start looking at that, invest at that relationship. So what we're going to do is control for one variable first, and then look at that effect. So here's kind of how we can think about it. Uh, hold on, before I do that, I forgot, I moved the video, what is that? Sorry for anyone that's watching, <coughs> we had that, here's our output, you should get something similar to, to this, there's our significant interaction. Now what we're working on is the, that next step. Alright, so here's the way we look at it. We've set up, let's say, a factorial experiment where we have 25 data points in each of these combinations, all right? If we had no significant interaction, then this low, medium, high, whatever that trend is, is the same across all of our rows, across all of our light levels. Whatever the trend is vertically within a column is gonna be the same in each of these three columns. But our interaction is saying that's not the case. Whatever trend we see here could differ depending on what light level we're looking at. Whatever trend we see here, vertically in our column, could differ between the columns. So what we're now going to do is control for one of our variables. So we're going to take, let's say, low nutrient first. And we're going to say, OK, among the low nutrients, do we have a difference in height across the different light levels, yes or no? If we do, we run a Tukey's post hoc test to, to interpret that relationship. And then we have to do for the median, and then we have to do, for the, do that same thing for the high. So what we've done now is controlled for nutrient levels to investigate the relationship between light levels and plant height. Well, after we do that, then we're going to control for light. We're going to look across the rows. All right, we're going to do it all four, you know, four times for all four different light levels. We're going to control for light to investigate the relationship between nutrients and plant heights. All right, so how do we do this? Well, I'm going to start with the nutrient levels. And the way that I find is, is easiest for me, at least, to analyze is to go ahead and make subsets our own different data points, or data pockets, of the low nutrients, medium nutrients, and high nutrients. So the, for, for the presentation, I called it dat low, dat med, dot, dat high, where I'm creating a subset of plant growth where nutrients is equal to low. All right, and I create all three data sets first. So in this case, we are controlling for nutrient level. And then what we're going to do is run an ANOVA on each of these data sets. And if I get a significant difference, I'm going to run the two keys. All right, so for example, here is the low nutrient. Or, yeah, the low nutrient. So I'm going to create a model where I fit height as a function of light, where data is equal to date where data is equal to dat low. And then I look at the ANOVA table. Why don't I have nutrients in here? We had it in our, in our original model. Why don't we have nutrients here? What's that? And what do we do? 
All right, so we don't have nutrient because we're controlling for it. So by taking the subsets, nutrient drops out of our model. All right, so we know our, our, our simplest model at this point. I'm going to go back a few slides. Our simplest model is this model. Height is a function of nutrients times light. As soon as we took subsets of our nutrients, this nutrients drops completely out of our model. Because we're looking at low nutrients. We're only looking at one nutrient condition, just low. We're interested in the effect of light on plant height. So in this case, I have significant ANOVA, or significant p-value here, suggesting that under the low nutrient condition, light affects plant height. But we don't know what that relationship is. You know, is it different for each of our plants? So as we increase the light, plant height changed. Or are two of them the same, or three of them the same, when we only have one difference? This is where our post-hoc test comes in. So then, what we do is we have this model that we've created, mod low. We know light is significant, four different levels. But then we do a two-piece HSD. Yep. Where did you create that low? Our subset. This is how we controlled for our nutrients. I created a subset for every single nutrient condition. Do that after the class class or before the Q-Q? What's that? What? Does it matter? Uh, when did you do that? Did you do that before the Q-Q plot? No, what Q-Q plots? What Q-Q plots? Yeah, so what we've done, yeah, we, we did our Q-Q plots, we did our brown foresight test, right? We know where we're good. So now I create my full model. Copy and paste. Create my full model and look at the ANOVA table. There we go, significant interaction. And now we control for nutrients. So this step, now I'm creating dat low is a subset of my plant growth where nutrients is equal to low, and I'm going to create all three. Medium, high, created three new data sets. And then from here, I created my model. So LM of height as a function of light, where the data set that we work with first is that low. And I look at that ANOVA table. Oops. There we go. That's significant, and I'm just going to add it right here. All right, so with this two keys, the ANOVA told us that light has a significant effect on plant height in the low nutrient condition. That relationship is that there's no difference between the 20 and 50% light there's no difference between the 75 and 100% light, but there is a difference among all other ones. So if you think about it, the lower, if we have 50% or less light, it didn't change our heights. All right? We had probably very tall plants at that, at that case. Uh, and I think that is the case. 75 minus 25. The average is 75. Yep. Yep, so we're in the negative. So the plants are tallest at 25 and 50% light. They're shortest at 75 and 100% light, but those two groups are not different. Now, there is something that we didn't do. We ran an ANOVA, right? What didn't we do here? 
We didn't check the assumptions. Why didn't we? We took, we checked our complete model, our full model. If our assumptions for that full model are met, then they're going to be met for any subset of data that we work with. All right? So these assumptions, we check them with our full model. If, they, if they're met, then they follow through. We don't have to do any more assumption checks. If we violate assumptions, we can't violate assumptions, then all of a sudden become, you know, meet our assumptions again. So you can kind of see best case scenarios, our assumptions are met, because then we could use ANOVA, ANOVA in two keys. So this is the low. We also have to do medium and high. So go ahead and do that and, and look at our relationships. So I've got it up here, medium, significant. In this case, all of them are different, right? All of them are different. Then the highs, significant ANOVA, significant difference for all of you. So we have done, color coding these. 
you get a mean value of zero to zero? Zero e to zero? It's uh, just super low. Yep. <laughs> just super low. <laughs> so what we've done is check. We've controlled for our nutrient conditions. So we've controlled vertically. And what we're doing is looking for the effective light. And what we've seen now, and I've color-coded it based on significance, but it only applies vertically. We can't, we're not comparing across. So for the low, these two are the same, these two are the same. But they're different. But these two groups are different. So in terms of the graph, we had taller plants, whoops, taller plants for these two, shorter plants for these two conditions. For the medium and the high, all of our comparisons are different. So the tallest plants were at the lowest light levels, and then we kept getting shorter as we increased the amount of light. Does that make sense in terms of plants? Right? Makes sense in terms of plants. You reduce light intensity, they tend to grow taller to get more light. Right? Yeah. All right, so that's only one aspect now. That's only one aspect. We've controlled for nutrients. Right? Get here, complete the analysis for light levels for each nutrient. Levels. We did that. So this is, I kind of color coded it. This is. This is what we've looked at. We did this. We just now compared in each of these points. I should say, so our viewers can see it. We compared the low. Now we can actually say, yeah, the, these two are similar, these two are similar. All four lines are different for the medium, all four lines are different for the high. We can say that. That's the effect of light. Now what we have to do is control for light to see how nutrient affects our plant height. All right? So what we'll do is I will give you time to do this, and we will pick this up on Wednesday. Because I think by the time you finish doing this, it'll be probably, yeah, 6 Yep. So oh, my two keys there, I'm getting an error message on that one. Chris has said there's no factors in the fitted model. No factors in the fitted model. We just had that question, right? What what was the what happened? Did we have that question? Yes, so we did. You were my bad. So well actually it wasn't in the class. Oh. So what ends up happening is two keys needs a factor. What where are we? Here it is. Two keys does the factor one. Yeah. Right? But if you don't have factors, it doesn't know the groups that it's comparing. So, by chance, did you read in your data set again? Did I read it in again? Yep. So, I'm going to read this in, read plant growth. Now remember, when we read it in at the start of class, we went through the factor, right? Yep. Now, if I go down here, and I, I didn't do that, Right? I'm going to create my subsets here. All right? Now I'm going to do my mod, and I run my ANOVA, and I get p value, right? I run my two keys, and you get that error, right? The exact same error. Just because you. Let's look at, let's look at the summary of our model. It gives us a single line for light. And light should be? It should be at least three. Yeah. So one is built into the intercept. All of our others have their own effect. So this read it as if it was a continuous variable. We, got the, we get the same p-value. And we get the same p-value because that's just how it works out when we do uh, uh, least squares method. So, when you get this, there's no factor. Right. So what we have to do is convert this effect to a factor. 
So just as a preview, if we had a continuous variable like this, we don't do a two needs. Our interpretation is this. So with each unit increase in light, our plant height decreases by 0.03 units. That's our interpretation for continuous variable. That's why analyzing continuous variables are pretty easy. Except when we have an interaction term. Then it becomes difficult. So what you have to do is go back to your code where you did your factors, rerun that, create your subsets again, right? And then you can create your mod low, do your ANOVA, do your two keys, and it should work. And just if we did the summary, you can see that we have light 50, light 75, light 50. Cool. Read it all. <laughs> See what you meant. It Did it work? No. No? No. Alright. So I think whenever I did uh yeah. whenever I did the flight of the factory, I mean I could just do it in the Yep, and then that has to be your light, and we create this, and so we need to make your light. But that might fail. No, no, that'll be. Yeah, that'll probably still fail. Chase has a better light. Maybe I'll run that. Oh, this is happening. Yeah, that's kind of. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, so, I'll also my Cool. Okay, I'll leave. <laughs> That's what I, okay, bye. <laughs> you, can, you can hand me my pink slip uh, via email, in person. <laughs> Pick this back up on Wednesday.